All right, good evening and welcome everybody. In tonight's webinar, determining lot sizes and entry points. I'm actually gonna flip that around. We'll do the entry points first and then the lot sizes, obviously. My name is Mike Rothink. I will be presenting it to you today. Now, before we get to the webinar, as always, please take a moment to read the risk disclaimer. Yeah, it's long enough. All right, so what we're going to discuss today is uh, I'll introduce myself first for those that don't know me, uh, so you have an idea of who I am, what I do. Um, and then we're going to look at how to find your entry and exit points uh, on your charts. So from an ideal perspective in a bigger picture and then along the way in your smaller perspectives, right? So your smaller trades. Now, obviously, from that, I'm going to show you how you can do some lot size calculations, what the difference is between using linear like a static lot size and when you use a variable lot size based on percentage capital. Um, and for that, I made a spreadsheet for you all. So you have a little bit of an idea uh, on what the differences are and how that works out in the long run. And then number four, we're basically going to put it all to practice or we're going to put it together. Now, we're going to be using the chart along the way. So number four is more like a review where we put it all together one more time. And then for those that are watching the recording on YouTube or uh, the recording that's been sent to you, the last part will not be there for you. That's the Q&A. Um, but for those that are in the live webinar, what, we will have a Q&A at the end. So if you want to be joining us for a Q&A as well and want to have some questions that you can ask, join us on the next webinar and we'll have a Q&A for you there as well. All right, so let's crack on. <clears throat> right, so about me, uh, like I said, my name is Mike Rothink. I've been trading in Forex for a little over 15 years. Uh, I started uh, basically freshly 18 uh, in college and Basically, I was doing international business studies, uh, a Cambridge program that I studied at Deltian College in the Netherlands. And I rolled into a, a hobby, uh, and I was good with numbers, and I rolled into something what is now known as Forex. However, like most of you, um, especially at that young age, uh, looking to get rich fast, as everybody does, um, you know, young and stupid. So, you know, after following a bunch of YouTube videos on uh, intraday trading and day trading and make $500 a trade in a day and all that kind of nonsense, uh, you know, three accounts down the drain, I figured, okay, so this doesn't work, clearly. I'm sure it has worked for somebody at some point, but it's not working for me. I didn't want to give up on it, so I basically threw everything out the window that I thought I knew started from scratch and really started learning every single aspect of the trading charts and the tools available and the markets themselves in order to get to where I am. So when you fast forward that, uh, eventually got to a point where I was consistently profitable on a yearly basis. You fast forward that about 12 years and I was able to get to my goal, rotate out and look at some other things, but keep involved with the FX market, of course. So that brings me to what do I do? So for the past six or so years, I have been giving webinars um, like the ones that you are now been uh, made available to you by Legacy FX. Um, this is a little bit of uh, obviously content for Legacy FX, but from my side, it's 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 a little bit of a tool to try and help pass on some of the knowledge that has worked for me in trading and especially avoiding some of the beginner mistakes that I definitely made um and that i had to learn the hard way and hopefully this will save you a little bit of, of distress and uh, a few walls to avoid uh, to get you a better start now that ties in obviously with mentoring uh that makes sense i have a few students that i teach the various things that i teach here um on a one to one basis obviously and then other than that obviously i'm involved uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with other projects usually it's investment related um right so people that look for investments ask me and then i look over the pitch decks and stuff like that uh it's it's usually financially related um i was working on my cisi uh diploma which is you know financial advisory that was more for me to get a better understanding of offshore investments uh something i'm more tied into now um you know structured notes things like that to get a good understanding of how to manage you know for instance my pension portfolios and stuff like that um, and that's it. That's me in a nutshell. 
All right, so let's start with the stuff that you actually came here for. Okay, so the first thing we have to do before we get to lot sizes is obviously we need to determine how to get our entries and how to determine our exits. Now, we get the, I get this a lot where, you know, people tell me, it's like, okay, how do you find out what your entry points are? And they do their technicals, but the one thing they don't do is actually read the chart. Now, let me explain that to you. So but without doing any technicals, right, let's grab a chart. Any chart. So anybody have a suggestion what chart you want to see? And we'll go over it. I like to be a little bit interactive. So anybody name a chart. GJ? All right, first, first comers get, so GBV, JPY. All right, so let's do GBV, JPY. Let's start here, okay? Now, as you notice, I start in a day. Now, I know that some of you trade in the smaller time frames. We'll get to that in a bit. But it's important to always start on the high end to get a good understanding on what the market will do. So if we look at GBP, JPY, for instance, and we look just in the year 2022, don't start doing this. Okay, yeah, it's been going up for the last two years, right? So having that understanding is like, okay, generally speaking, if you do long-term, if you would be a big investor and you do long-term periods, talk about like, you know, holding offshore accounts for six years, you'd be buying. But we're retail traders. Unfortunately, we don't trade for six years or positions. Most of us don't even trade it for six hours because we can't keep our hands off of it, right? Um, so what we look at is where are we right now? So the first thing I look at is just in this brief over to, we had like coming from an uptrend. So where are we at coming from an uptrend, we had a certain peak reached, we had a pullback, which is perfectly normal. And then we had a rally back to the previous high, slightly over, and then it had another pullback and another reach. So what does this tell me? This tells me that here it had a peak that it's reached in this period of era, and it's also indicated to us a low. So it basically gave us a high and a low range that it wants to move in between at current market conditions. Now these may change in two months, right? We're talking about pound yen. So uh, policies made in the pound in the next two, uh, in the UK in the next two years could influence these levels from a bigger perspective in the point of view. And obviously, Japan and their banking policies could also influence how they are going to be uh, related to each other. But from a trading perspective, without doing any technicals, what I'm looking at right now is I have a high and a low, a lower high and a slightly lower low, almost equal low, then a lower high, but then it hasn't pulled back. So this could still be moving. But in general, we're moving more sideways than we're moving downwards. Right, so this is not giving me, and if I have a smaller account, I just wanna have the clear signals. I don't wanna take the risky trades, right? In here, in this particular example, I would be looking at it's like, there's not any clear direction that it wants to move in right now, because if I take this hole, we're looking at an average price line somewhere around here, right? About 50% of it, it's underneath this price line, I'll mark it like roughly here. 50% of the time it's under, 50% of the time it's over. That doesn't really give me a whole lot of direction. It's not a direction steady, steady trend that's been lasting for a while. What I would like to know is, okay, now I could say, okay, I go look back a little bit more and I see in general, it's more a buying consensus, but that has accelerated. So if that would be the scenario, I would have an idea of, okay, I would probably want to look for buying moments more than selling moments, although the market right now looks more like selling. So those two are contradicting each other. Therefore, this market is not stable enough for me if, uh, as, as a small retail trader to really make a benefit of trading this. And there are so many charts you can take advantage of. Don't put yourself in the position of, I only trade pound yen. I only trade pound pairs. I only trade gold or oil or certain stocks. You have all these tools available, so use them, right? You don't have to stick to one thing. Now, 
that's the first thing. So that's just reading the chart, and that's without including like, okay, what are the fundamental drivers doing for the two different countries? What are the what are the bank statements and policies, and how are the investors reacting to it? Forget about all that, right? Long term, that's very valuable for us short term traders. It doesn't really affect us much apart from understanding that the long term trend is currently up. But at the moment, it's kind of sideways more than anything else. All right, so. Now that's the first part. So we read our chart, but let's say we're in a scenario where I'm confident I want to find a trade in this. So the next step you do is you utilize your technicals, right? We are retail traders, therefore technicals do have a value and because they're kind of self-fulfilling prophecies. So let's start with the basic technicals, right? So let's, we identify our high, we identify our low. Now, do we identify this low? No, I can see that that's a low, but this is a day chart which means that it going here is going to take months is not relevant for my current trading in the slightest. So this is low enough. This is, this will be a good rally for three, four days. That's plenty of time of indication that once I get here, I can redo my lines from that point onwards. Then here we try to find some, now here you have this muddled system. So what we, what I tend to do is just go to this chart, which clears out basically all the static, all the wicks. And now you can find, if there is any clear line in between, and it doesn't seem to be. We have this one that has one probably here with a wick two and here with a wick three. This might be a long wick four, but then you have these two combined to each other. So then this one goes out. Now let's take a look back at candles. And yes, they all wick in there. So this is the stronger line than the bottom bottom that we had. So this punch through was an attempt at breaking out past this point. Unfortunately, it didn't, and it just pulled back in. So now we've identified those. Now, if we go to the smaller time frames, we're going to find all our other resistances in between. I'm not going to do that right now, right? That's your technical top-down analysis. So you, if you do, for instance, 15-minute trading, you would do day, one hour, 15 minutes. If you do one hour execution, day, four hour, one hour, etc. Make sure to color code them. Otherwise, you don't know what you're looking at. Now, we can try to make a channel here, but we can already know that this is never going to line up with the bottom here, right? It sort of does, but if I put this line in, right, from the start, and I have to go over the greens, and we're kind of pushing in, this could be indicative, but this is a pretty broad channel to work with. And for us that are trading in a smaller time frame, it's not really all that usable, but it is, valid now remember that trend lines don't go through charts however in a downtrend it can close on the line and open outside and then work its way in on the bottom side it can close outside because that could only mean that it might accelerate the downtrend and it's vice versa if you're talking about an uptrend okay so now we happen to be in a situation where we have a resistance here we don't have any further resistance but we can identify if this downtrend, if we can call it that, is going to hold, then this would be roughly the turning point. So we actually identified our entry points, right? Anywhere in this region would be a good entry because we're expecting then a movement this way. Now it could go here, bounce off of that back up or break through and go down, right? These are our potential movements, right? It doesn't have to be accurate. The other option obviously is that it does that. It breaks out and goes back to the top, which would then vindicate that yes, we're moving sideways more than anything else. But if we look at probability, we're trying to get the highest probability for profitable trades, right? Now, excluding indicators, we would now wait, first of all, for this day candle to close and maybe another day. We're also maybe using price action as an indicator. But what we do know is that this is going to be at least two or three days, which means that when we now go to an hour, anywhere in this box, relatively speaking, is fine to enter in. Now, look how big that box is. You have so much time. People always worry about, oh, the entry point is 
you know, that, that one candle. No, that's the perfect entry. You're not going to get the perfect entry every time. The, the, the amount of times I have perfect entries, meaning I started, it never went red and just went straight, straight to take profit, the perfect trade. I can count them on two hands, probably. It's always a small down draw and then slightly short or, right? It depends on how you set up your take profits. depends on if you do swing trades and stuff like that. But this box is quite a few hours long. So we're already in it. Now, if I go to the end, that's 94 bar. You have 94 hours to make a decision on when to go in. So you have plenty of time. Even if we would cut this box in half. Right? So let's let's do that. Let's make it really tight on an hour. Like this is a blip on a day. This is like a two-day frame. Right? This to here is 43 bars. There's almost two full days of decision making time. Right, so you can wait till you get your confirmation on your RSI, MACD, triple moving average, whatever you use. If you use indicators, you can wait for price action if you use that. But what we can do already is no matter where my entry point here is going to be, <clears throat> my stop loss I can already determine. Now we know that the next daily resistance is like all the way up there. Eh, that's you know pretty heavy of a stop loss if we're going to do that. So outside trend, outside nearest resistance would be the smart choice. So let's go and take away all this static noise and get a clean view. Okay, we got one, two connections here. This is probably a wick, but that's slightly under, but that might be coming into effect if we enter here that this could be something that stalls it for a bit. So we'll keep it. And because we used red for day, I'll use blue for our hourly. Let's see what's the other one that we have, something that's outside the trend. This is one, two. If I do it here, I got one, two, three, four, and then probably these with wicks. See? Boom. Okay, so now, whoops, that's a bit too much. I'm just trying to get that box in view for you guys. Okay, it ends right here, so this is perfect. Anywhere where I go in, my stop loss is going to be just above this. And that might look like a lot, but like I just showed you, if I would go in somewhere here, it's a 42 pip stop. It's not that much. And your outside trend, and this is the day trend line, you can see that it can go through that in an hourly fine. That's a wick on a day, right? We have any at the entry points here with a 42 pip stop loss, and we have now to determine where is our exit point. Well, so here we get the, you can go for the full run, right? You could just go to the day chart. But for a lot of you, that's going to take way too long, right? You're either a day trader or an intraday trader. So like at 24 hour, 48 hour frame. But what you can do is that on the way down, every time it bounces back up, you take the sell, you take the sell, you take the sell. And that way you take this long-term trade, but you break them up into smaller sessions. Every time applying the rule, outside what is going to determine then an inside trend so like here we're in the downtrend but right now it's rallying so we would have something like that right this is roughly what we're working with roughly so actually it looks a bit this yeah so roughly this All right so this is probably going to bounce off here pull back a little bit now you also have a cross reference here that's the inside trend line where it might bounce into this so as it breaks out this it might pull back a little bit more and then bounce off here and then go back to our box so that would be entry point heat one entry point two but to keep it simple inside this box we want to go in and even if this goes up to here right if i make the box a little bit longer like we did on the day right if it goes here, that's perfectly fine. Then it's at the top of the upper trend line. So it's already, well, not forced, but most likely going to turn for a bit. And it's at the top of the day chart. So if on the day chart, this candle closes underneath this purple line, and on an hour chart, it also closes underneath this line. We'll make this one blue as well to make the difference clear. So blue is hourly. Purple is daily, purple and red, right? 
Uh, what do you will get the recording? Don't worry. Okay, so we enter anywhere here. Our stop loss is predetermined to be somewhere here. Outside trend, outside nearest resistance. You factor in a few wicks just in case it has a little bit of a spike. Okay. Now there's a whole other webinar of other steps that you need to do, but that could be things like checking the fundamentals, see if there's any news announcements, et cetera, et cetera. So let's say we go in, I do a pending order and I go in here. Okay. Now I'll get to the exit point in two seconds. So that's my entry. I should have done the red one first. Okay, boom, boom, okay. Now, where's my exit point? Well, once you would go in here, it needs to break this hourly thing, whatever that is, in order to make it. But we have the other line here. So once it breaks that, I can already do that easily. Now, the question is, do I move my take profit here or do I just go for the full run and have a really nice ratio of 40 to 300? All right, that's a good ratio well over your one to three average but okay anywhere up between here is a take profit i can take but i want to look in now okay where are the daily resistances make that big make it blue all right boom okay so did we just pass one we just passed one see boom so year one two and then it had some relevance here as well but recently it's been relevant in the uptrend. So let's find another one just underneath it. There's one here, or there's a point there. So if I take this point, what do I get? Okay, maybe this was a big wick. Let's take a look. No, no, okay. So that's not valid, so it is higher. Could be that it shifted a little bit. Let's see if that one's a wick. Yeah, so if I move it up a little bit, I'm now touching this wick, these two wicks, and a solid flat point here. And if we go a little bit further back to history, not too far, uh, it actually actually meets the top here. So we now have an indication that this is probably a very uh, solid resistance point that we need to keep in mind on the hourly time frame. On a day, couldn't care less. <clears throat> but on an hourly, which is what most of us are trading on, it does. So I can determine, okay, this will be my first take profit because it will most likely, if it bends off here, bounce off this, and then go back up and give me the new entry point, right? So my expectation would be that either I go in here and it does this, unfortunate, but can happen. It goes here and bounces up. And then again, you have the option of this and this way, but let's not overcomplicate things right now. Then we bounce through, we go there. Then we get like a little bit of a pullback because of this resistance. And then we get the breakthrough to this point. And that's our first point. Now you can also think like, okay, well, why not just go sell, buy, sell, close, buy, close, sell, close, buy, close. Sell. Like now you're doing a whole bunch of steps. For what? This is 20 pips and then, you know, 20 pips back and then 20. Where's your stop loss going to be on this? Like what, here? Like outside this range with a take profit, that's 20 pips. Like it doesn't make sense, right? So you don't try to trade like a machine and have 600 trades a month. Actually, we can just do this. Let me just move that out of the way. All right, so like we, we determine our entry point. We look at the, we read the chart. We read the options that are available that can happen. But in both scenarios, this will eventually win. Obviously, there's also the option here that it breaks through from that point, right? But in either case, it's more likely to go here than it is likely to go here. And if it does go here, it doesn't matter when it does it. it we just picked the wrong direction, right? But, but I'll get back to that. So this, entry and this stop loss is outside trend the big trend outside resistance and we place it just above the wicks so this is a huge space right and that huge space is only 50 pips my take profit 0.1 is 100 pips so it's 50 to 100 one to two that's more than enough 
preferably one to three on average, but if you do smaller trades, you're not going to get that very often because the distances of the smaller time frame channels are very short. So unless you take ridiculously small take profits, uh, stop losses, like you get people that do this. But now you're just outside the trend and if it wicks, it hits you and it can wick to here easy. So now, yes, now you fixed your ratio because you only have a 17 pip stop loss to 100, right? One to 10 almost. But you're, well, actually it's like one to six. But when you factor in the amount of probability, the risk that it can hit your stop loss there, it's much higher than if you just set it up here outside this wick. Because here the trend is much lower than here, so it shouldn't go back to this level. And if it does go back to this level, it's most likely broken a trend because it'll flow outside this trend day on a day. So it will go up. So we don't want to stay with our cell. We want to get rid of it. And losing is not a bad thing. We prefer winning, but controlling your losses is more important. All right, so now we've determined our entry, we've determined our stop loss, and we determined our first stop, take profit. Now, once you're in this scenario, once it pulls back and you start getting a second point, so you wait for it to close, we wait for a negative candle to close that we have a confirmed top, now you can take this one away, and then you draw whatever is going to be the trend then. Right. <clears throat> right, we draw whatever the trend will be then. And now you have a reference point of when it hits the bottom or when it hits the top. So you can determine in the downtrend every time you get to the top is your entry point. And you do the same applied technique. Outside trend, outside first resistance, factor in a little bit of wick, and that's your stop loss. Now you have your entry and your stop loss over and over and over. When it comes to your take profit, you can do two things. So here we had a down. This was the first bottom, let's say, and this was the second bottom. That is a difference of 50. This is a difference of 40. This one has a difference of 40. 50. 50. So 50, 40, 40, 50, 50. Right? So an average of, well, 48, but let's say 45 for ease. So you just take your take profit 45 pips lower than the previous low. Done. Because on average, that's where it roughly should take. There's another fill safe we put into place, different webinar, but you trailing stop, you can utilize or manually moving your stop loss to secure your entry and profits along the way. Okay, so we've done our technicals, we read our chart, we planned the movement. Now, the variables is now the next step. So what are the variables that you can have before and during your trade? Anyone want to take a gander on that one? What variables do we need to factor in before I open my trade? Come on, who's brave enough to take this one? So the question is, what variables do I need to factor in before setting up my trade, before actually opening my trade? when I've identified what we just did. What's one more step we wanna do? Nailed it, Derek. So for those that wanna answer that uh, don't know yet, there's a question mark on your screen. Click on it, it opens a chat box. You can type your answer there. We'll get the lot size in a bit, Patrick. Yes, correct. Are there any news announcements, right? So now that we know our trade, right, we can also get a rough estimate of how long this will take if you factor in the average angles that it takes downwards, et cetera, et cetera. But let's just say this will take 24 hours. Cool. So if I go in here, let's say this candle is currently here and we go somewhere, this is like the average angle, let's take 24 hours. Okay, so we go to legacy effects, we go to the economic calendar. Is there anything related to pound or yen as a news announcement in the next 24 hours? Because that can screw with your trade. And remember 24 hours, if you're looking about longer term trades, your 24 hour window, actually 48 hour window, is your starting, is your trade developing still, right? It hasn't done anything unless you got lucky, but most likely it's still kind of developing. Therefore, you want to make sure you're not 
being influenced by any news announcements. And if there are news announcements, you want to utilize that and understand the information to see if it could benefit you in accelerating the growth of your trade or if it could slow you down, right? Interest rate decisions, uh, bank statement policies, uh, if you're trading the US, the NFP, the NFP very much, because if you would trade the open the trade now, the NFP will have a spike usually when it comes out. It won't affect the long run anymore, but you will might have that you have a spike, hits your stop loss, pulls back, and then just does what it was supposed to do. And then you're staring at a screen with a lost trade that hit your take profit. Well, that sucks. And that's the worst feeling. I know, I've been there. And I know some of you have too. Right? But under normal circumstances, that shouldn't do it. <clears throat> so let's say we are here. Now we need, we checked our news announcement. There's no news announcement in the next 24 hours, which is what the expected duration of the trade is going to be. Might be a little bit longer, might be shorter, but roughly. Now we wait for confirmation. Now confirmation comes in different aspects. So if you're using indicators like, I don't know, st uh, let's say MACD, Stochastic, and RSI, you wait for all of them to confirm that the signal lines are now going from buy to sell, right? Volume flips to sell on the MACD, the signal line goes away from the volume, showing that the volume is increasing faster than the signal, so there's more pressure. The RSI that they're going through the 50 line, which means that there is a relative strength flip now, right? So there's more pressure for sell there as well. Maybe you have a mid triple moving average and the fast and the medium EMA just went through your slow moving uh, uh, moving average. So that's another confirmation. If you're using price action, you wait for price action to confirm it for you, right? Or use all of it. Like sometimes you might not get one thing, but you might get the other thing. And you always want to have at least two or three confirmations because every single one individually could give a false signal. Every indicator does, every other technique in the world does, right? There's sometimes you get a perfect morning star, but the, mar the, the, the market doesn't shift anyway, right? It might've hit Fibonacci levels, but it's not doing what, it's, what you would expect it to do after that. You wait for something else as well, because one thing could be telling you A, while the other is telling you B. But if they're both telling you A, your indicators are telling you A, your technicals are telling you A, and your entry point determined on the day chart is also telling you A. If, if that's not confirmation enough for you to then pull the trigger, we have a different issue to solve. Because the probability of this now being a successful trade, if you look at 100%, is not 50-50. It's at the very least 70-30. It just sucks when you happen to pick the 30, but if you consistently take it, you should win seven out of 10. And with the proper risk management, you couldn't care less about the three. And that's where lot sizes start coming in. So <clears throat> when we look at lot sizes, it's a part of risk management really. It's also part of your trading strategy. Now, there are certain trading strategies that use a fixed lot size. But generally speaking for us in retail, I found fixed lot sizes really hamper the growth of your account and accelerate your losses. Because you're trading a linear equation instead of a variable that slows down when you're losing and accelerates when you're winning. You're technically compounding, which is, you know, basically what you do with a Roth IRA or something. So how exactly is the comparison? Because I often get the question, well, if I take this trade on a fixed lot size or a variable lot size, what's the difference? Well, the problem is the sample size. So let's take a sample size, okay? So here I drew up a small chart. Now these trades are on both sides identical to each other. They're literally copy paste from each other. It's the same account, same win rate, same amount of trades, and obviously the results are the same. So let's start with a thousand dollar account, right? Which is a little bit under the average, but it's a small account that is relatable to most. I know some of you might have 10 or 20 or $30,000 accounts. Maybe there might be a few of you that's institutional. You just multiply the numbers. It's not that hard to do. Now, the fixed lot size that we're using here is a mini lot. 
in the variable, we decided we take a fixed risk of 3% of equity. Be careful, equity, not capital. Now, my win rate here is 70%. I know, seems high, we'll get to that in a minute. Now let's do 20 trades. So these 20 trades, you're just gonna have to trust me, this is a 70% win rate. In total, we made a profit, all wins and losses combined, of 650 pips at one mini lot at $650. So the ergo, my account's now 1,650. Great return, All right, 65% ROI. Okay, pretty good for 10 to 20 trades. And if you look at the stop losses and take profits, this is all at one of two ratios. These trades aren't big. This is very, very doable. Yeah, you, I'll explain that in two seconds, Patrick. That'll make sense in a minute. So here, let's take the same trades, but now we take a fixed percentage risk on my account. <clears throat> so every trade I take, I take 3% risk. Factor out the variable between risky trades is half and stuff like that, but let's take a fixed risk of 3%. Here's the thing. Determining how your trading is going to go, your 3% on your new account increases the level of risk you can take monetary wise percentage wise it's always three percent so if you have five open trades at the same time you're risking 50 percent 15 percent of the account fixed now with european regulation in place your margin call is at 70 percent right 30 percent margin uh margin call which means that even if you have 10 trades open at 3% risk, you're running 30%. Now, let's say you go in 20% down draw, you're at 50%. You still have way more space. There's not a chance you'll ever get margin call unless you do something really weird. So that's one thing. Here, if you open too many trades, well, you're trading linear. You're, you're literally trading a flat line. So here you can see I might start, I have 3% risk and a thousand is 30 bucks. So that trade I can take at one mini lot and two micro lots. So I get 0.12. For Excel, that calculation doesn't work. So it looks at 1.2 here, but just move the decimal. So profit, right? 60, I make a little bit more. This, the other one is equal because it's one and one. I make a bit more, da, da, da. Now, the end result is the same 650 pips generate $897 profit here, or pounds or euros, whatever your account's in. So I make a slightly bigger profit, but this is at 70% win rate with 20 trades. It's a pretty small sample size and a pretty high win rate for some. Okay, fine. Let's do 45% win rate. I don't know what that is. Is that a value? So let's do a 45% win rate. It's literally well, more than half that you lose, right? So same 20 trades, same setup again, 3% versus one mini lot, all the same trades. Here I make in the end 155 pips profit with a 45% win rate. It's a one to two ratio. So I made 155 profits. Now, obviously, it depends a little bit which ones you win. You can flip them up and down, but on average, this is going to equal out to the same thing. Because even if I take this 100 pip trade and make it a 50 pip loss and I flip another one for it, it, you get the same result, roughly. All right, so here on a percentage, let's see what happens. You can see here what happens with my risk level. It goes up, it goes down, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, down, down, up, up, down, up, up, a little bit down, up, down, 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 up. So as you start having a losing streak with a variable lot size, you, you start stunting the way that it drops. You start curving it off because your new 100% is less than the previous 100%. So your new 3% is also less than the previous 3%. I hope that makes sense. So your lot sizes, you calculate differently every time. 
Now let's look at the same, same 155th profit, but I end up with $224.50 profit here, almost, and almost double, a considerable chunk more. Yeah? Okay, so in a graph, boom. This is what we're looking at, high point 1287. This is the 45% win rate version. On a low point, this one had a highest peak at 1260. Well, this one at 1287, so slightly more. But remember, this is still a small sample size, 20 trades, right? Some of you do that in a week. You shouldn't, but some of you do, okay? I'll answer that in the Q&A, Patrick. It's a good point, but I'll get back to that. So let's take <clears throat> an even worse win rate. Let's go 35% win rate. We end up with 45 pips loss, so I lost $45 here. But when you use percentage, because you're declining your risk as you go along, the 45 pip loss ends up in a $24 profit. So I'm still above my entry. I'm actually still in profit. Not by much, 2.4%, but at least I'm not below my initial investment. But let's extrapolate that idea with a terrible win rate of 30%. That's getting worse. I mean, I, I, I really suck at trading, apparently. But let's do it over 50 trades. These are obviously equal to each other. You can see here that the variable goes below my original 30 all the way down to a low of 23 at some point. Minus 485 pips, so at one ratio, I lost half my account. But here, 30% win rate, 148, 485 pips, I only lost $135 in total. This is over 50 trades. Am I in a loss? Yes, of course, well, you would with 30% win rate, but not by much. This is, a, this is recoverable, very recoverable. So let's, let's take a win rate of 60%. This is, I think uh, this, this should be 50. I don't know why, there. <clears throat> so 60% win rate over 50 trades. Here you can see the difference. So I make 1,154 1, trades. Let's say this is an entire year. You did 50 trades in one year. I a little over doubled the account. I know for some of you this sounds really ambitious, but with a small account, it's not that weird. But here, I almost tripled it. Because percentage-based. I even had some trades at three micro lots. On a th uh, three mini lots. Do we have anything higher? 3.6, yeah, 3.6 is the highest even, right? But anyway, you end up with 280% return on investment. Pretty good for a year. And that's on 50 trades, nothing crazy, no trades of like 3,000 pips and all that kind of things. Now, when we talk about trading strategy, somebody mentioned scalping, that's a different thing where I tackle all of these. I'll answer your question in the in the Q&A, Patrick. Um, I'll have to ask you to wait for that. I'm more than happy to answer that question. So if we do fixed losing versus percentage losing and fixed winning, this is the differences. So when you're losing in fixed, you literally have almost a linear line straight down. I don't know why it's slightly scanted here, just basically straight down. But when we look at the results, this ends up underneath a thousand. This one ends up below above a thousand. We also won more because we ended up higher. Now, if you look at the percentage difference between high point and low point, it's going to be lower than this these two points. Now, when you take it over those 50 trades, this account did also win in this scenario, 60% win rate, but this just won better. And when we were losing, you can see how this curve is in here. When we started losing, it started curving off because basically it would have curved off like this. Right? Because your 100% keeps changing. 
as you have a losing streak, which you inevitably will have at some point, you're curving the slow, you, you're slowing down the decline. You're slowing down the loss. With a linear one, you're not slowing down anything. You're just literally going straight down. Especially if you combine that with what some people have as a strategy, fixed stop loss and take profit points. I have a whole topic on that why that doesn't make any sense. But that's our variable versus list sizes. Now, determining your risk levels, this is a little bit of a personal thing, right? A lot of people start at one, then go to two, and then go to 3% risk. But generally speaking, if you take 1% risk, it makes it very difficult for smaller accounts to work. Because if you have a $1,000 account, which is already small, and you take a 1% risk, you have a $10 or 10 pound risk. If your stop loss is anything over 100 pips, you can't take the trade on any lot size because you can't go lower than 0 0.01. Now, if I'm not mistaken, um, for most of you, that's, that's already pretty big stop loss, but the stop loss gets determined by your technical location. Remember, outside trend, outside resistance. So whatever that distance is, that's your stop loss. The stop loss is a number. It doesn't matter if it's 10 pips, 50 pips, 200 pips. It doesn't get a value until you've put a lot size to it. So we can make that anything between, if we take 100 pips stop loss, we can make that anything from $10 to $150, $100,000, right? If you do multiple standard loss. Everything in between. So there's a percentage that can work for you there. So how do we calculate the lot size? Well, let's go to our example that we did earlier. And let's use our entry and our stop loss to determine a lot size. So we measured here a stop loss of 48 pips. Round it up, make it easy for yourself, right? 50 pips. It's not rocket science. You don't need to have the precise. You're not trying to land a shuttle of the moon, right? Ballpark is good enough. Calculate the ballpark. Don't go like way off. All right. So if my scenario, this is guys where the chat comes in again. My entry point A versus my predetermined stop loss now, 50 pip stop loss. Now nah, make it easy. A thousand dollar account at a three percent risk. What is my lot size? Let's say you just opened the account. This is your first trade. You have a thousand dollars. You are willing to take a three percent risk on the trade. What is my lot size? How do we turn 50 into 3%? So let's start with what is 3% of 1,000? $1, 30, yes, right. So if our risk is $30, right? If we would take the trade on the mini lot, we have a mini lot, so 0 0.1. It's a dollar per pip. Not exactly, but at, on average, right? It's a dollar per pip. It's $50, right? So that's too much. So we can't take another mini lot. It's too much. $50 is bigger than our 3%. Right? It'll be 5%. Now, some of you might have a risk level of, of 50 or of 5%, then in that case, this is your answer. But we took 3% risk. So, well, half of it, so 0 0.05, right, one mic five micro lots would be 25. We can go slightly higher than that. So it's either 0 0.06 or 0 0.07. Six being slightly under, seven being slightly over. So now you have to make that choice. So let's take the scenario that we take 0 0.07, okay? 
So if we take this scenario, then I'm risking my 3%, which is 35 or 30, right? Uh, 0 0.06 would be, well, hold on, let me double check this. 0 0.66 with 36, 6, 12, 24, no, 30, actually perfect. So 0 0.06 makes it exactly 30. So if I trade this trade on 0 0.06, I'm risking $30 for my 50 pip stop loss. And now I could care about my take profit because before that, I don't care. I've never heard anybody complain about more money. I, I've heard them complain about losing though, more than I want to admit, right? So if now, well, when you set your take profit, you'll see it, but it's 120 pip take profit. Okay, so if it would go the full length and hit my take profit very neatly, perfectly good. Look, at, did you everybody see what this bar did, by the way? It went up and then it got rejected. Fun. Now we wait for confirmation. We go 120 times 60 cents. Right, so we're risking 30. And we're going to make about 65-ish. Okay, if you have a $1,000 account, 65, that's good. Six and a half percent ROI on a single trade. Do ten trades of that a year, you Gucci. That that's literally less than one trade a month. So yeah, plenty of time to wait for the right entry. Right now, if we would look at a different chart, I obviously prepared one for you all, sneaky. You would ah, maybe something like this. So now when we go to a day or an hour, and we zoom out a little bit, you can see how big these boxes really are. And you can see anywhere in this box, I could have gone in. Now it would have been unfortunate if you went in right here, but if you combine that with your indicators, where's my box here? None of these were actually signals for go, because this was nothing. So now when you get here, you get to the oversold. And this is where the MACD signal line goes away from the volume and the volume flips. So anywhere, once this crossed through your, your 50 line right here, that's where it said it's time to go. So your entry point would have been right there at the opening of this red candle. And this is where I mean, like your example is like, okay, you would have gone down first but your stop loss would have been outside resistance, outside trend. Now, in this case, you would have to follow your stop loss over here outside the wick just to make safe. That would have been a 80 pip stop loss. Now your take profit would have been because we had a predetermined in this scenario. We have a predetermined new entry. A whole different webinar where we did this, where you get there, but the average angle was this, which is what it's doing. Above, it's gonna go up and then go back up. But what's important to note is that if you would have taken the, okay, hold on, I need to get this chat box out or I can't see anything. The previous highing levels as your reference for your first take profit, I'm looking here. I'm, I'm not looking at anything else, boom. You would have actually nailed it right there. And that's based on this. Even if you took it a little bit lower, let's say you were skittish and you took that one, you would have hit it on this wick. You took it even lower and you took it here because you just wanted to go a little bit above the previous high. Well, let's say you took the previous high, you would have hit it there. Any scenario from signal to there, you would have made it. But the thing is, if your stop loss is here and your take profit is here, that doesn't make any sense. You're equal risk, right? Risk to reward is the same. So you would have had either to make the choice of I go outside resistance, outside trend, and I take the risk with the wick. So I go outside my box, boom, one, two. So now my stop loss is 53 with a small risk that if it does a weird wick like this again, okay, but if it does that, then most likely it will also break through, probably. But we now have indicators also helping us out to give us our signal. I go in somewhere over here. 
And now my this take profit makes sense because now it's 50 to 60. But now if I go back to the other idea, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm expecting obviously to go past the previous high because it wants to do, you know, go to the top of the daily channel. Now I'm not going to go all the way over here because I'm a day trader. I'm not going to hold this trade for six days. Somewhere over here, previous, but you probably would have taken these previous two highs. Or maybe you were ambitious and you took that. Would have still hit it. And that's being ambitious. Right? And now your ratio is fit. But the funny thing is, this ratio doesn't change. Your entry point closer to where the take pro stop loss is going to be obviously means that the pips will become a smaller number. Therefore, your um, lot size will get much bigger. So the better your entry point, the bigger the lot size, which means that if your take profit is static, so let's say my take profit is here, this entry point determines a lot because if I go in very late, I'm one to one. If I go in really early, let's say right here, this distance will increase my lot size to keep the same 3% risk, but that also increases. So it's a double edged sword. If I use a fixed lot size, it doesn't damn matter where I go. It's always going to be just whatever the increase in pips is. But here it's exponential. So you benefit more from when you nail that entry. And when you pick the wrong trade, because you lose less, generally speaking. Okay. So, like I just said, distance, right, is pips with a lot. Uh, pips, it's just a number. Lot size plus pips is a value. So, distance of pips on its own means nothing. Until you put a lot on it, that's when you commit to profit. That's when you commit to risk, right? And lot size calculations, we did, right? We did that example. So let's recap this. Let, let's put everything back into perspective. Let's do it from scratch on a new chart. And I'm gonna do it quick and dirty. Give me a chart. Shout, first come, first serve. All right, Reno wants gold. Let's do gold. Uh, do they have it like this here? They do. All right. So gold spot. Now, generally speaking, let me just point this out. Commodities like gold, you shouldn't trade it on an hourly. This is a thing you trade monthly, if not weekly. This is long-term kind of stuff. Right, you should be trading price point to price point and stuff like that. But that's a whole different story. Let, let's just take it like you want a day trade gold. Let's let's do that. Okay. Let's read the chart. What do we see? We had a high point and we declined. Let's see how relative this is. Oh, wait, hold on. See, a little bit more. We're not at a high, high low point. We're moving sideways. We have two price ranges that we're bouncing in between for the last two years almost. So if I would have to ask probability chance, what's a higher probability? It going back up to here or it breaking through and going down past to P2020 prices? Is there any significant market change in South Africa? Did any of the mines have a massive increase? Did they find a new vein? Did somebody discover a new mine? Don't think so. Is there a massive influx in demand maybe? I don't know, Christmas coming up. You know, the, the raw materials are at a purchasable price at the lowest point since the start of the year. So if everybody in any of the factories need to start buying up bulk for actually using, then maybe oh, that's interest. Yeah, this chart is live. I know, I know, I know it's the interest rate, but don't care about the Fed. 
it's already basically factored in. You'll see a little bit of a spike, and then it's not going to do a whole lot. Unless they do something really weird. Let me just... Okay, let, okay let, let's have this fun, guys. Oh, stop! Let's see what your prediction is. Uh, no, it's as predicted. It's a small rate hike. Okay, so let's see what that did to Euro US dollar, for instance. Okay. Absolutely bloody nothing. Look, it's moving. Not really. What's factored in? The market, especially the bigger volume. Yeah, but the minutes are just going to be the same static. Dose. This is going to do a little bit of jumpy, jumpy stuff, and then it's just going to pull back and continue whatever it was doing anyway. Look, it is in, it's a rise in favor of the dollar, but the market is moving against the dollar. Anybody know why? Because it used to always be the other way around. Yeah, exactly. It's already priced in. And it doesn't fix inflation in any way, shape, or form. So nobody cares. It's a funny market we're in right now. Anyway, this is going to have like a, the next two hours a little bit of jumpy, jumpy, retail traders buying, selling, trying to scalp stuff for some reason. Like even on the South African rand, it's doing nothing. Like, and this is a volatile exotic. Like this should have massive spikes, it doesn't. It's barely a candle. All right, let's get back to the thing at hand. What were we doing? Gold, right. So we identified on a day that we have two big ranges and obviously there's a few resistances in between. So let's clean it up and let's do those real fast. This is obviously going to hit with wicks to confirm because that's an assumption one yet, but okay, perfect. That's actually dead smack in the center. Oh, that's odd. For anybody to think that is actually odd, it's not. Because if I now take half of half, oh, look, <laughs> roughly right there. Hey, you might argue, okay, because the market shifted a little bit, it could be here. It's also three connection points. Now you have to think about what's more relevant, right? This was the market in 2021. So rather I overtake rule, I overrule it with the market of 2022. The more recent market overrules the past market. The only time you really use past market is if you're at a, at a really low low or really high high and you have no reference point, then you can use the past as a reference point to at least get an idea. Okay, this is enough lines because this is on a day chart. So this is like, freaking weeks away not months all right now can we determine a, a trend here well we know that it's in a sideways movement but that does mean that this is like a breaking point when it gets through this it'll probably shoot all right so that's one point do we have a bottom one to go with this not really right like this is a little bit diverging no this might actually be with a wick let's check Oh, it did. Yay. Well, there you go. There's your channel. Well, right now we're moving up in the down channel, but we're late, which means that if, and we're on a day, by the way. But it is likely that what it will do now is the same like it did last time. Angle there. Angle there. Let's put these angles together. They're basically roughly the same. So on average, they're doing the same angle. So there. Boom. Now, what is more likely to happen at that point because of this ranging thing is that it does, does something like this. But there is the option of it finally doing this. <clears throat> that, we don't know yet. That's why we wait for confirmation when we get there. But that's our entry point for a sell if confirmed. If it breaks out, it breaks out. And we don't, obviously don't take the sell. But that means that till there, we can take a buy. <clears throat> We don't really have much to work with right now. Sorry, I need to take a sip of water. One second.
There we go. Okay. So let's take a look at the smaller time frame. I hate doing this. Okay. A commodity like this on an hour is is really tricky because it just changes the mind within it. Like really, these are long term kind of things, right? It's gold, right? It's long term investment kind of stuff. Um, it's not really a day thing, but or an hour thing. But okay, let's let's work with this. This is the whole effect of that interest rate, obviously, because gold is tied to dollar. For now. Okay, do we have something here we can work with? I'm looking at these two points. Never use the active candle, guys. Nope, that doesn't really work. I mean, then, then I have to wiggle with it. I got something like this. I'm pretty sure that that's bounced off and it's doing that. So what level am I looking at that it really needs to break? It needs to stay above this level, obviously. We want to... Hold on, I keep having to chat my way. Let's see, where's this resistance? Let's take that. Boom. We've got a point here. That's one, two connection points. Three, maybe? What if this one? What about this one? One, two, three, maybe? Four. That's what it's struggling with right now. Okay, let's take a look. Yeah, almost. If I move this down a little bit, touch, 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 touch. Okay, so this is kind of what it's with. That's actually perfect for now. And then we have the next one, which is somewhere over here probably. Okay, we can also consider this one maybe. One, two, three. Yeah, we can consider that one. And now we have this solid one here. One, two. And now we get to the high point where really, like if we look at the, the ways that it averagely goes up, that's like 12 hours away. So that, that's plenty of time for my trade to develop. We'll use it as a reference point. Okay. Let's go. Boop. All right. So our entry point is actually here. We would prefer a buy, although we're looking a little bit of a sell. We would compare our indicators. Do we have any? Well, we have a double bottom. That could be our price action confirmation. We had a double bottom here. Um, if you can please drop again for a moment. I'd be grateful for that because I would like to go in roughly around here. And by doing that, my stop loss will automatically go outside trend, outside resistance. But because this wicks so much, I want to take a little bit of consideration. This is actually a pretty decent entry. This is a 26 pip stop loss on gold. This is rare. So let's do the next one. Our take profit will then be here. But let's say you don't want to be too ambitious. Let's go here. But I don't care about this. What I care about first is this. 26 pips. Now, with commodities, your lot sizes work differently, guys. What's the lot size in uh, legacy effects? The smallest one you can do on uh, commodities. Standard lot? I think it, I think you have normal one is mini lot, right? So this would make it a standard lot because in commodities, depending on the executing, blah, 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 forget about all that. Yeah, so a mini lot. Okay, so the mini lot will have a value of 10 cents. It's a tenth. It's it's not like euro US dollar where it's one on one. Right, the exchange rate works differently here. Blah, blah, blah. So with exotics and stuff like that, you get really get a difference. Okay, so if it is 0 0.1, but is the actual value, right? 0 0.1 is the actual value of 0 0.01. All right, so this is a 25 pip stop loss. In the same scenario, we can take this trade on our standard calculation of one and what, 1.2, 0 0.12. So you now move the decimal because a lot size has a 10th of the value here. So this would be a trade on a thousand dollar lot that you take at 1.2, which will give it a value of one dollar twenty per pip, and then you have your take profit being a hundred pips versus my twenty five pip stop with one to four, perfect. 
So that would be, hey, come back down for a second. I'll take the trade, see if by the Q&A we finished it. Doubt it, but <clears throat> uh, that's 1, 000, yeah, 111 pips. So uh, that's, what is that? What did I say? $1.20 per pip? So it's $120 profit. Pretty good. Now you combined everything. And we factored in the news because we're waiting for the news announcements effect to wear out now. And then we open the trade. <clears throat> so we can wait for the next for this candle to close on the opening of the next candle, then we have a good idea to go in. Now, if that red candle starts out red, you can wait a little bit longer and you can then go in then. But you want to go in as close to this as possible. So you can now wait for a few hours. But once it closes above this line, you've lost your opportunity. You will have to take a, a worse entry because then you have the range from there to there already. Right? Then you want to not wait too long with pulling the trigger. All right, let's go back to your US dollar. Let's see what it did with this whole interest rate decision. Oof. Oof, look at this spike, guys. It's a candle with a total size of 30 pips. Oh my God, the markets are so slow nowadays. I miss the days of GBP, JBY candles being 450 pips an hour, but oh well. <clears throat> Times change. All right. So, that said, for those that are now not coming, or for let's start with the start. For those that are watching the YouTube video, thank you very much for watching. Uh, subscribe to the channel and check out Legacy Effects and the other videos that we've made for the other webinars I've done. And thank you for watching. Now, for the people that are in the Q and A uh, webinar, before we go into the Q and A, for those that are leaving us, that are not going to stay around for the Q and A. Please note that when I close the webinar, usually it sends out a survey. I don't know if it will, but usually it does. It's anonymous and it helps me get feedback. So first you can rate me as a presenter, the content itself, but it also allows you to give suggestions on what else you would like to see, or if you want to tell me a little bit more and worse, like what you think I should improve or something like that. So please, it would really help me out and Legacy Effects to get an idea <clears throat> of the feedback that you guys want to give me. Okay, having that said, let's go to the Q&A. We had a few questions come in through, and I'll revert back to those. Let me answer the one that's just been asked now. You're welcome, Reno. Can I share the Excel file? Okay, let's see if I can do that. Guys, hold on. Let's see if I can choose a file. Oh, I can. Awesome. Is this working? Upload it. Upload it. Send it. An error has occurred. Okay, let me try dropping the file. Hold on. Can I get out of this? Yes. Oh, Christ. No, wait. Okay, go here. Drop and drag. Boom. Does that work? Or maybe because it's open, I can't send it? Close it. Close, close. Wait, hold on. Oh, save, whatever. This is file isn't a supported format. What do you mean? It's an Excel file. It says right here, supported formats. XLS. You know what? Sometimes I hate this program. No, I won't send it. Okay, let's see if we can change the format. Christ, now we're doing tech support while we're doing all this. Uh, general flex. Oh, wait, let me go to the file location. Uh, wait, where's file location? Yeah, open file location. Yeah, but I, I need to open a Google, uh, uh, I need to make a Google file then. Let's see if I can change it to XLS. Let's see, if, let's hope that works. I don't know if it will. Yes, I want to change it. Okay, let's see. Let's, let's see if it does XLS. I could drag and drop it this time. Nope, it won't do it. Bugger. 
Nah. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. It, it it for some reason it won't send it. Uh... Yeah. Well, I can't. This is the thing. If I send it from my email address, it'll be a little bit of a problem for Legacy FX. What I'll do. Oh Christ! Did I close this? Uh, present. This part's not in the. There we go. If I send it from my email, that's my 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 own company email. That, that that'd be a little bit weird for legacy effects. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'll send a file to the um, the the marketing director, and ask them to send it to you guys with a recording. Is it fair enough? And I'll make it a little bit easier actually. Um, I'm going to send this to everybody, by the way, webinars at legacyfx.com. Okay. Send to all. <clears throat> the email I just shared for you guys, any questions you have about policies, uh, about legacy effects in general, uh, like for instance, I, I'm one of their rewards you can ask for their, they, they, doesn't legacy effects have like this bonus point system, like account system, you can claim like rewards and stuff. One of them is a webinar with me one on one. But what you can do is if by the end of this webinar, so by, by next week, you don't have the file in the recording, just send to webinars at Legacy Effects a request for the file. I'll make sure the lady that, that goes is in charge of this email will have it. I'll send it after we send the web send it to her with like if somebody asks for it, just send it to them. Okay, and obviously with a request to send it out with the recording. Uh, that, that's that, that's the best I can do right now. I mean, because uh, <clears throat> obviously I work with Legacy Effects, but not for them. So it's like using my company to during a webinar of Legacy Effects would be a little bit uh, eh, wouldn't be very professional. Um, right, okay, so let's see. What uh, was another question somewhere earlier? Something with scalping as well, I think. Ah, doesn't your risk percent? This is a good question, by the way. Doesn't your risk percentage depend on the strategy? Scalping higher risk and take partials. Yeah, okay, so scalping in particular and swing trading and martingale strategy, they have a different way of approaching the market. But if you use swing trading or martingale, which are two variations of the same thing. First of all, you're not trading with a thousand dollar account because these strategies don't work with that. Right? Martingale, so swing trading, you step in, let's say you want to sell. You go in, sell before it starts selling. And every predetermined amount of pips, let's say it's every 20 pips, you open another sell. Fixed lot size, no stop loss. Bomb, 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 bomb. You keep setting it up. Now, eventually the market will turn and then when it goes down, you wait for it to go all the way past all your entry points and then you close all the trades. Maybe you still have one or two, but it starts to stall. You close all the trades and you made a profit from all the trades that you've passed and you lose the ones that haven't been passed. So sometimes it passes all of them again and then you make a big, that's swing trading. But obviously because you don't have a stop loss and you keep going negative as you're building it up, you need a large amount of margin to do that. Now, if you're a real baller, in retail trading, you can do something called martingale strategy, which is the same concept, except you now double the lot size every single position you open higher. And this goes fast. Let's say you start on a mini lot, right? 20 pips later, two mini lot trade. You now have three mini lots open. Then four, eight, 16, you're already at 1.6 standard lots. Right, you understand where we're going? If you do this on a standard standard uh, on a thousand dollar account, you blow up the account before the trade even starts. But that's not going to be a bright idea. Now with scalping, so scalping is more the idea of I go in, I go out, make two, three pips at a time, but I have a risk of like 30 pips every single time. And 
it's basically a volume, but you need to understand that this means that if you trade and you do this on like a minute, if you scalp like that, which is the proper technique, you need to have a ridiculously high win rate in order to even get anywhere near profitable. You need a 99% win rate to be profitable. 98% your account's losing. So this is generally not a technique for retail traders. This is a technique that was sold in the past by a lot of so-called account managers because it's a great way to get people to blow up their account. And then you don't have to deal with the customer anymore. All right, because people just start slamming trades 100 times a day, losing most of them. Right, you gain nothing. So this is the problem with scalping and scalping in the true form that it's used now you're talking about supercomputers that are connected to wall street for instance that are on the other side of the street of the trading floor across the street literally with a direct line into the trading floor with supercomputers to do seven thousand seven thousand trades per second based on micro pip changes at direct money like Guys, this is not something we can do. I mean, I can click fast, but not that fast. Right, so just do normal, consistent trading. All these trading techniques I just mentioned, by the way, apart from swing trading and martingale, which are very good trading techniques, but require a ridiculous amount of capital. But you're going like, that's like the halfway bridge between retail trading and actually investing long-term in things yeah okay um i hope that answers your question by the way patrick so yes the answer is yes different techniques have different percentage risk but this is why you determine it for yourself look at your strategy if you have a strategy a, a full-fledged strategy not a technique then yes, you factor in what your risk percentage is, but your risk percentage automatically will translate what your lot size is going to be per trade because every trade that you calculate, you calculate that risk percentage of your strategy. So you're still using a variable lot size that way. Um, that means... Uh, Okay, so next question. Um, hi, can you please? Okay, uh, so we have a low trader network. Just landed in the yes. Uh, ah, okay. Sorry, Sunil. Um, yes, you will get the recording, and as always, this uh, webinar will be uploaded to the Legacy FX YouTube channel, uh, which you should be subscribed to, um, where all the other previous webinars I did are there as well, including a few series that I did for them like technical analysis if you're a starter, technical analysis part one, two, and three. So where you start with the lines, then you learn how to do the entries. Right now we skipped, we skimped on it a little bit, but then it's more in detail. Watch them, you have risk management there, fundamental trading. So you can find all the basics that you need as building blocks to basically then develop your trading. I hope that answers your questions now. Um, for scaling and scale, for scaling and scaling out, what do you mean for scaling and scaling out? Do you use a fixed lot size? Oh, scaling in and, and out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No. So <clears throat> what I just explained now is in both situations, you would use a fixed percentage per equity because if you use a percentage based on your equity, right? As your account grows, the 3% becomes a higher value. Ergo, you're accelerating your growth, but keeping it consistent at a risk. But your profit starts multiplying. You're already starting to compound. But when you are starting to lose, which you inevitably will have a shit month and you just start losing a bunch, we all have, right? You start slowing it down because your 3% on your new capital starts getting smaller and smaller. So you're curving you're curving your losses, which means that when you start winning, you automatically recover much faster. Now, when you combine that with, for instance, the webinar I did on risk management with a bunch of other stuff, the chances of you losing your account is so minimal. 
but people want to get rich tomorrow instead of make a 10-year plan. Make a five-year plan. It's an investment, guys and girls and whatever you identify as. It's an investment. Investments are not overnight things. Now, normally speaking, if you have a bag of money, you give it to an investment fund manager and they will do the offshore investment. They got a whole team. They got everything they need. You have way more tools than you do and more manpower to make the same decision. We're basically doing our investment portfolio management by ourselves as retail traders, kind of like in a play scenario. It doesn't mean it can't work, but we know from statistics, most people don't win in this market. And it's because of different things. They try to beat the market, which is a dumb sentiment. You can't beat a $6 trillion market with your thousand bucks. Makes sense, I think. You Right, we're just along for the ride. So you need to understand movements, why they happen, how they happen, and move with them and benefit from them. You're not trying to make the most perfect trade in the world. You try to find the most consistent trade. So trading with the trend, not always, your trend is not always your friend because it sometimes breaks out. But if a trend is starting to develop and it bounces three, four times on average, if you take all three or four trades, you lose one and win three. And they're all in favor of the trend. So they are more likely to go full run to bottom of channel or top of channel than against the trend where they sometimes, which you've probably seen, it stops halfway, then goes back down and then does it again. Right? This is why trading against a trend is something you do later because you do want to benefit from both up and down in the same trend. But when you have a smaller account, you need to pick quality over quantity. You don't have wiggle room. You need to be patient. Wait. It's better to do two trades a week. Like I see if you're going to kill me for saying that. It's better to do two trades a week than two trades a day. I hope that makes sense. So yeah, I always use percentage. Fixed. Now there is a variable. So eventually you'll start learning like, okay, so you go to 4% risk or 5% risk, whatever you're comfortable with on your account. <clears throat> but let's say you do 4% risk, right? And if you're against a trend or more, you see a trend that you think like, hey, that might be a really good trend, but ah, it's, it's not really clear. It's a little bit risky. I'll take a punt. Then you take 2% risk. So now you get a variable within your risk management. You still adhere to most of the other rules. And then, you know, you have a little bit of a variable. So now the risky trades, so against the trend, you take half the risk as with the trend. Combine that with exposure, combine that with trailing stops, combine that with, you know, stop loss management, da, 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 da. Hey, one of the webinars, go to risk management webinar. I show you that you can have a win of, a profitable account with 40% win rate. All you have to do is risk management. Controlling your losses is the most important thing. Winning doesn't matter. It happens automatically. It's a flip side of controlling losses. It's more important to stay in the market for a long time because the right way to term to trade investments, especially in the financial market, is time in the market. However, us retail traders with our $2,000 accounts are not going to take a trade and leave it open for six, six years, like a structured note. Like we just don't. So we have to rely on timing in the market. So you want to benefit from the time in the market. So the time in the market is the general consensus of what the market wants to do <coughs> and trade in favor of that because that's where the big volume is anyway. They don't change their mind that often. Most often they can't even do that if they wanted to. Like a structured note, that's a fixed strike date and a fixed closing date. End of discussion. There's a fail safe and there's a stop loss point, but that's beside the point. Um, 
Yeah, it makes sense. I see a lot of traders. I see a lot of traders take 10 trades on a, of a specific lot size. Why do they so do so instead of one trade with a total? Yeah, I don't know, Patrick. I, I see this all the time when I get people from mentorships. It's like, yeah, so this is my trades. Um, and I look at it and it's like 10 euro US dollar trade, buy, sell, sell, buy, buy, sell. And then it's all the same lot size, different stop losses, same take profits. It's like, what did you do? Change your mind 16 times in one day? What? Like, what, what do you expect the trade to do? Like, you open it and go to your take profit straight away? That doesn't make any sense. Markets don't move linear. You have to let trades develop. Like, take a breath, wait, let things develop. Set it and forget it. Which is harder to do than it sounds. Um... Uh, <laughs> yeah, what it was a little bit of a moment of silence, isn't it? Huh? Oh, gold is up my requested 1720 level. Oh yeah, it is. Okay, perfect. So now we wait for this candle to close because we're still in that one hour, right? So now you would wait for the candle to close, develop, and then you want it to close the day because now it's too late in the day. You want it to close above the day line and then you do your decision. Um Okay, so yeah, uh, Ernest, just send a request to webinars at legacyeffects.com and they will be able to send you the recording once they've uh, made it ready for sending and uploading. Um, <laughs> you're very welcome, Patrick. Uh, let's see. Okay, does anybody have any further questions? Uh, final call, last beer. What time is it? Oh, we actually nailed the timing. Ha <laughs> ha. That's a first. No? Okay, I'm just going to assume either everybody fell asleep, is confused, or understood everything. That's the three options. <laughs> Uh, if anything comes up, guys, just send an email to webinars at legacyf.com. If you have a question that comes to you later, just send it to their email, and they'll make sure to tell me, and I'll give you an answer. Um, having that said, so, again, for everybody, thank you very, very much for coming tonight. I hope it made sense. I hope you learned something. Um, and reminder, uh, please, that once I close this, it probably sends out a survey. I would highly appreciate the help if you could fill out this survey. It gives me a good reflection of what you think of the presentation and the content. Uh, and constructive criticism is always welcome. Uh, otherwise, how else do we improve? And also, it helps you to give suggestions. What do you want to see? What do you want to learn about? And then I can make the content for you guys and create a webinar with legacy effects to give you the content you guys want. All right. So that said, guys, as always, have a great evening, day, wherever you may be. And in regards to your trading, as always, trade smart, trade safe, and see you on the next webinar.